So um, as Praveen said, I uh, work with Huntington's disease patients. And so uh, what I was going to do today is talk about uh, some of the emerging therapies that are being proposed for Huntington's disease. Um, there has been some activity over the past year or two. So um, I was going to review all that. And um, anyone, please ask questions if you'd like to in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the talk. Uh, we, can, we can do it real time. Um, and I see there is a chat. Okay. Um, so as we know, uh, neurology, along with uh, many other disciplines in medicine, faces this valley of death, um, which is the translation of basic science findings to useful clinical therapies. And so we can make a lot of progress on this end. And then it's that jump to uh, in man or in human that seems to be impossible. Uh, but over the last 10 or plus years or so, we've actually made some progress in this realm. And so it's uh, an exciting time for neurology. Um, although I guess uh, there are people over many hundreds of years that would say that their time was the most exciting time in neurology. But nevertheless, we can say that there has been progress made. We're getting some uh, traction on disease modifying therapies for a neurological disease. And so Spinraza was probably the, the, you know, the flagship medication for disease modifying drugs using um, therapies that uh, manipulate splicing um, and, and did show a clinical benefit. And so it's now in the clinic. Um, there are uh, gene therapy efforts on a number of other repeat genetic repeat neurodegeneration diseases, including um, ALS and spinocerebellar ataxia. Uh, there is always an ongoing discussion about how these uh, sophisticated therapies, um, how much they cost and the effect on our sort of uh, national perspective on um, cost benefit. But, you know, there's very few people in, in most of these rare diseases, so it, it doesn't seem like an overwhelming cost. Um, certainly not when compared to some of the more common diseases uh, that have a $56,000 a year price tag that have been recently uh, approved by the FDA. Um, and Huntington's disease um, is, uh, has also been the target or has also been um, a, a disease in which some of the new um, disease modifying therapies have been tried. And we'll get into the details, but um, there was some exciting progress made on um, lowering the, the uh, dose level of the mutant Huntington gene. And uh, in initial phase one, phase two studies, uh, the phase three um, did not pan out as expected. And so um, there are some bumps on the road and, and I think that's not surprising, um, but I mean, we'll talk about it. So George Huntington um, is the man doctor uh, after which uh, this disease is named. And you know, Korea had been known for hundreds of years, had been described as such this sort of dancing, uh, dancing disease, but uh, it wasn't until uh, Huntington actually put it in the medical record, a description that that uh, captured not only the, the Korea, but also the familial nature of it. So uh, he describes um, riding in a carriage with his father, who was also a physician, um, and they came upon two women, mother and daughter, that were almost cadaverous, bowing, twisting, grimacing, and, um, and noted not only that this was a, a movement disorder, but that it seemed to pass from generation to generation. And so that, that capturing of the inherited nature of it was um, very well described in his paper in 1872. And then since then, there have been another, uh, a, a number of other important um, moves in the, uh, in the early milestones of Huntington's disease in the modern era. So in 1955, there is a Venezuelan doc who uh, appreciated that what was being described as El Mal um, locally was uh, probably familial um, movement disorder, was probably Huntington's disease. And so uh, a number of decades later, um, researchers, including Nancy Wexler, went back to Venezuela to study these families, these communities with Huntington's disease, knowing that there is probably a good way to, to get genetic clues about, uh, about the disease when you have so many individuals. And so within a few years, they're able to localize the region of DNA that was segregating with disease. And about 10 years later, they were able to sequence the gene and identify that there is a repeat within the coding region of the Huntington gene 
also called HTT, um, that uh, encodes a CAG repeat, CAG nucleotides, which encode a, a, a glutamine, and that there is a string of these CAGs that in Huntington's disease gets expanded. So this was really um, groundbreaking. It was reported in the New York Times. It was one of uh, maybe one of the first few um, genetic diseases to really be described in such um, molecular detail um, and has since then been uh, sort of an example of how we approach neurogenetic diseases in the clinic with regards to genetic counseling and diagnosis, et cetera. Um, so finally, after the gene is identified, um, the people on the bench can, still, can go start making models. And so within a few years, they had um, started a number of Huntington's disease uh, mouse models. And from there, um, you know, you, you figure you know what the gene is, can't be that far from knowing what the mechanism is, and we should be done with making uh, therapies. And that, you know, of course, um, didn't occur. So it's been a lot more complicated. Um, so what I'll talk about today is uh, I'll just review um, the basic symptoms um, and genetics of Huntington's disease in case there's anyone who doesn't um, typically see these patients. Um, We'll go over what are some of the recent experiences with the HD lowering drug trials, uh, and then um, alternative approaches to gene lowering. And then I'll also talk about um, what we can learn from the naturally occurring um, phenotypic distribution of age of onset. You know, those biological, there's what are the biological cues in that in those cohorts that can um, maybe give us some ideas about, um, about novel mechanisms to target. So the basics of Huntington's disease is it's autosomal dominant. Um, and then typically the disease is adult onset. So usually between the 30s and 50s, although the range of age of onset is very uh, wide and it can be, it's been reported as early as one to two years in a very um, young onset juvenile case to all the way identified as the, the first um, diagnosis was made uh, in the individual who was in his 90s. Um, the disease course is progressive, so there is ongoing change uh, in the brain. And infrequently, that repeat can expand, so the, the expansion is unstable, as we know, and so typically it can change between one to two, more often uh, than not, um, the number of repeats from generation to generation. Um, and when that repeat gets a little bit larger, that mechanism or that, that path, that pattern is called anticipation. And so a repeat of 42 in dad that turns into a repeat of 44 in daughter is anticipation. And that increased size is often associated with an earlier age of onset. So infrequently dad's repeat can go from 44 to 54. And that large jump um, is generally when inherited from dad, but can also happen um, from mom. Um, juvenile HD presents differently in children. Um, and uh, well, HD presents differently in children, so it's given its own name. Uh, and the prevalence in the Western world is maybe uh, 10 to 15 in 100,000. Um, the prevalence is different in different populations. Um, and uh, and it's, that's related to the, the genetic background um, that is uh, more at risk for expanding into a disease associated um, size. So um, the um, the disease used to be called Huntington's chorea, and typically the, the symptoms associated with have been movement, and largely because those are the ones that are more um, easily observable, um, and they're quite characteristic. So there's the chorea, which is the unintentional movements. There can also be ballism, very quick ballistic movements, um, dystonia, um, motor and persistence, and so um, this becomes a problem because um, folks come and they've got gait problems, they're constantly falling, and it's not necessarily because they have ongoing movements, but often it's because they just lose tone in their legs. And unfortunately, as we know, there's no, there's no medication to treat that. So it becomes very complicated or uh, challenging to um, try to help folks as they start to um, suffer more from those um, sort of untreatable movement problems. Uh, they have impaired saccades, and so uh, you know if you walk into the room and they really can't look around, they have to turn their head in order to move their eyes, and um, that becomes more of an issue when people are driving, and uh, so sometimes it becomes uh, 
you know, a conversation with people that they don't want to have. Um, and then there's also discoordinated breathing and swallowing. And generally, as the disease progresses, um, aspiration um, is a frequent cause of death. But in addition to the movement, there's the other um, other pieces of a triad, really, which is so there's cognitive dysfunction, and so um, their their dementia is really executive dysfunction, frontal. So they have impaired judgment. They uh, really have um, sort of life-altering decisions they'll make with money. They have difficulty with multitasking, and so uh, this gets in the way of of work. Usually, they have difficulty learning new things um, and poor concentration. And uh, so these are all the factors that eventually um, can contribute to people having to leave work, even if the um, even if the movements are mild. And lastly, there is a psychiatric aspect. Um, most often, it's depression, but can also uh, present or often presents with sort of obsessive compulsive um, type of behaviors, agitation, irritability. There's perseveration very frequently, um, and uh, and sometimes. Um, not frequently, really more psychotic symptoms like hallucinations, and sometimes those can be very difficult to treat. Beyond the typical triad, there are other more um, autonomic uh, dysfunction symptoms that, um, that we try to mitigate either with uh, medications, if it's um, a neurogenic bladder, or uh, more behavioral changes. Um, so juvenile HD is different from the adult onset in the sense that, uh, in, in, because it can sometimes present with seizures. And what we notice in kids is that they have loss of milestones, and so they'll have physical changes. So they have more uh, Parkinsonian features, stiffness and, and um, slowness of movement, but they'll have loss of cognitive milestones. Um, they'll have quick myoclonic jerks, um, and the disease course is faster. The juvenile presentation is generally if that CAG repeat, which is usually in the 15, 16 range, um, is expanded out to 60 CAG repeats. And, um, and most of those kids are diagnosed before they're 20. So uh, the relevance to the management is that these people obviously have a much shorter window between birth to clinical symptom onset. And, and um, so when do you, when do you capture uh, when you capture and start treating people uh, when they're going to be symptomatic very soon. Um, I will uh, just mention these that right now our toolbox includes uh, um, dopamine neuroleptics to manage both movement. Um, so Haldol, Flufenazine are excellent drugs just to deal with the chorea. Um, Haldol low doses, but typically that's not the first choice we have. But um, it had been used for a long time previously. More recently, uh, tetrabenazine has come online, which is excellent for people that have a lot of movement and not necessarily a lot of psychiatric or depression features. Um, and uh, there are some other drugs that have been tried that aren't necessarily as effective when done on clinical trials, but there are um, individuals who feel that uh, it's been helpful. And, and really these, you know, the, the combination of chorea and psychiatric features um, highlights that this isn't just a striatal problem. You know, it may, it may be striatal that then projects to other parts of the cortex, but really when we're thinking about drug access or, or drug availability, um, we uh, need to ensure that uh, we're, we're changing the biology, not just in the striatum, but in all, um, essentially all the brain. And there's, there's evidence of, of disease in, in, the, in the cerebellum. So, um, Folks with HD have a higher suicide risk, um, and uh, there will be families that have suicide, and so that's going to be, you know, environmental and biological. Um, fortunately, the SSRIs are very helpful for depression as well as obsessive behaviors. Um, Depakote um, and sometimes prazosin can be helpful for irritability and, and uh, outbursts. So, uh, and this is a a very abstract graphic, obviously. Um, and uh, so it describes the, the temporal correlation between clinical symptoms and what we presume are the neurobiological changes. And so, um, so here in green would be a description of what the functional status is of a human, of a patient. Uh, and their functional status might start to decline because they're having cognitive psychiatric features and their chorea may start to increase, which now impairs their movement disorder. But prior to all that, um, when, the, when the symptoms are clinically obvious, um, there is neuronal dysfunction and not all of it is irreversible. 
So uh, this sort of gap here between neuronal dysfunction and neuronal death is what we're hoping to uh, target. Uh, so again, this is a, a CAG repeat that occurs in the coding sequence of the gene. And uh, that leads to a protein of a certain size. And so in brown here are the glutamines encoded by the CAG in this track of the DNA. And so generally in healthy adults, it's between 10 and 26 repeats. In the expanded allele, that repeat number is generally between 36 and over 100. It leads to an expanded RNA and an expanded protein. And that has led to um, a lot of interest along with in other neurodegenerative diseases about the impact of aggregated protein or aggregated RNA. Uh, this is just a figure that kind of gives you a sense of where the general um, distribution is of repeats. And so even in the normal allele, there is variability in the repeat size. So it's not just 15 for everybody and then an HD allele, but there is variability in that, in that repeat number. Uh, the repeat number itself, I can move my thing here. Um, the repeat number itself is associated with uh, um, onset. And so uh, in individuals that have a, a number that is over 40, uh, they are symptomatic. Between repeat number of 36 and 39, that range is called low penetrance. And so there are some individuals that will develop HD at some point in their life and some that never do. And we'll get into why that may be. Um, and then there's also an intermediate allele, which is between 27 and 35. These people will never develop true Huntington symptoms, but there is the potential for that repeat expanding the next generation uh, and eventually producing uh, a symptomatic Huntington's person. So the correlation between CAG repeat and age of onset has been known for decades um, and grossly this holds true. And so the higher number of repeats, the lower age of onset, and you can actually make a curve. And the, the, but the interesting thing is while there is a curve that correlates age and onset, there is a huge uh, range. So even at 40 repeats, the age of onset is between 40 and 55 in this example. So the repeat number only explains about 50 to 60 percent of the variation, which suggests that there are other biological features, perhaps even genetic ones, that um, modify onset and progression. And so what is that? And can we uh, uh, target those pathways um, to influence disease? So we, we had the mouse models, we should be able to figure it out. And it turns out, at least it seems to me, everything that you check in vitro is affected by Huntington's disease. It's a, it's a ubiquitously expressed uh, protein um, and uh, it can act as a cofactor for transcription uh, in the normal, in its normal behavior. When it's aggregated, it can induce mitochondrial disease or mitochondrial toxicity. It can impair synaptic function. Um, and just uh, uh, worsen the, the normal proteostasis pathways, affect axonal transport. So there's many different mechanisms, and this is just the neuron um, that we're looking at. And so um, we haven't been that successful yet in identifying, say, the one mechanism to target. So the question is, well, can you just get rid of it, especially if you're proposing that part of the um, uh, toxicity is just this aggregate protein? Um, so there have been a number of gene uh, protein lowering approaches and that the, the um, study that came out um, most recently was, was using one of these. And so this is just a graphic because I'm going to talk about some of these uh, coming up. And so uh, going from the nucleus out, uh, there are, one can use CRISPR to actually directly edit the gene. There are zinc finger protein mechanisms to try and again, um, directly modify at the DNA. Um, once the DNA is transcribed, transcribed into a pre-RNA, uh, one can target with other molecules like antisense oligos or small molecules. And then um, out in the cytosol, um, there can be targets, uh, we can target the mRNA, uh, mRNA directly with um, uh, RNA inhibition approaches. Um, and the goal of these would be to decrease the amount of this and this in yellow here, decrease the amount of this exon one protein, um, the protein altogether, um, even though there, there are some other proposed mechanisms of disease that would include um, the RNA being toxic itself or um, alternatively translated protein, um, mistranslated protein. And so, you know, these are the theme here is that 
all of these mechanisms or these mechanisms in particular, the antisense and the RNAi are, you know, we're just introducing that one molecule, but then um, leveraging the uh, machinery within the cell to um, promote degradation of the gene. So the, the one most commonly discussed and the one that's gone furthest um, in trials with Huntington's disease has been this, the, the antisense oligonucleotides. And the idea, um, if, if um, people haven't um, looked at one of these for a while, is to introduce a small molecule that's probably only about 22, 20, or 22 base pairs long that's been chemically modified to make it stable. So here is the, the gene, the Huntington gene, also called HTT. And um, so we introduce this here, this um, HTT antisense oligo that's been modified for stability. It comes and it can bind directly to the gene um, and then uh, uh, promote its degradation. So um, there have been studies or that, you know, this was studied in mouse models um, to show efficacy. And so the early studies took a mouse and um, introduced into it a human expanded HD allele and then uh, infused directly into the ventricle and an antisense against the human allele. So it allows them to see you know, how, how um, specific is their, is their approach. So they have this mouse, the, the mouse um, always gets symptoms of HD. If you infuse this antisense uh, for a few weeks and then follow the level of mRNA, um, you can, and protein, you can see that after infusion of the antisense, there's a decrease of the human um, RNA, uh, and you don't see that um, in the control antisense. Uh, it's actually not a control antisense, it's PBS. Um, and then again, also, you can see a decrease of the protein. So it's effective, it decreases, and that, that decrease actually lasts for um, a number of months in this animal. So that was very exciting. Um, it also uh, helped uh, with the behavioral problems that this um, mouse model has. And so uh, just real briefly here, I'll, I'll just bring you to here, um, in the mouse that has the antisense against Huntington's disease. So here's a control mouse. He uh, takes a long time to fall off uh, a rod um, and he uh, enjoys exploring quite a bit. And uh, in the Huntington's mouse, he doesn't do that. But if you uh, try to um, knock down that mutant Huntington, uh, you can improve the behavior. And that, that um, effect on protein lasted for quite a long time, months uh, in the mouse model. So moving on to man, uh, the first question is, if you do this in, the, in humans, can you actually even have a biomarker to measure um, to know if it's even working? And so there's work that was being done in the meantime um, on a number of cohorts, both um, here uh, in uh, the Americas and in England, uh, and so looking at the um, mutant Huntington protein, and this is specifically the mutant Huntington in CSF of individuals, you can see that uh, we, they are able to detect mutant protein. So this, these would be the little circles here. You can detect mutant Huntington protein in individuals who are symptomatic with HD, uh, and they have more mutant hunting, Huntington protein compared to those who have the HD gene but are not symptomatic. And so this was done in a couple of cohorts. So that was great news. And so uh, they went into phase one, two trials. And this was actually published in the New England Journal, which was super exciting. I don't think that's been done before. And um, so they took uh, 50 patients or so. Uh, they had an escalating dose of this antisense that has to be introduced um, intrathecally. And um, so they went out and treated folks until after uh, day 85 um, and then took um, various biomarker measures. And what they were able to show is that in the humans as well, um, with increasing dose of antisense oligo, you can decrease the level of mutant Huntington protein. So that's terrific. There's target engagement, it works. Um, interestingly, so, so here, these little arrows are when they're being given the antisense and uh, you can see that there is consistent decrease of the mutant Huntington in the CSF. Once you stop giving the antisense, that level kind of, the, the levels sort of um, stay stable. So there's, you know, it's a piece of information we need to know about how often you need to give this drug. Cause right now I think this was every two to four months, maybe every two to maybe two months or so. Frequent enough that, you know, more frequent than you want to have an LP. But nevertheless, um, it worked like it should have. There was some attempt to do post hoc analysis of any kind of behavioral um, changes. And 
it was sort of suggestive that maybe at the higher dose, you might, so better is up here, um, at the higher dose, you may see some um, um, less worsening in individuals that had the higher dose of, of um, HTT. So the conclusion is that you can suppress HTT and then there were no significant side effects. There were some biomarkers that looked a little funny, um, but no one was too concerned about it. So it looked really good. Then they went to phase two, three, and that's what happened. Um, that was the news that, that, that came out this spring. Roche was the company that was doing this drug. And um, there was a planned interim analysis. And in that planned analysis, they found that it just, um, it wasn't effective. Um, they were measuring um, clinical outcome as well. And so they just stopped the study. And that was a real um, heartbreaker for a lot of people, the community. I mean, every community is like this, but they're very invested in this, particularly in this approach because the animal models were, were suggestive. And um, uh, so, so that, was, that, was, um, that was disappointing. Now, the, this particular molecule that Roche has uh, is just identifying a, the, some area in the gene of HD, of HTT, and so it's, it's non-specifically knocking down the um, HD gene, and, um, and everyone knows that, and so, so you, know, you get maybe half 50% knockdown or something in some of the earlier trials. Um, so there was there are a bunch of other companies that were doing the same thing with antisense, and one of them was called is called Wave um, Pharmaceuticals out of um, the East Coast, and so they were also running a phase one B two A trial where they where their um, antisense was actually modified to be um, mutant allele specific, and so that's because there is a SNP that is associated with the allele that is expanded, and so you can specifically target that mutant allele. But a week after this sad news about the Roche trial, Wave Biosciences released their results um, a week later and um, said that their, um, their studies showed that there was no change um, in uh, their mutant Huntington protein compared to placebo and no evidence of a dose response. So that was very disappointing. Um, but the good news about this and, and about all this is that really they, you know, they learned from some of these approaches. They're, they're very active in changing the chemistry of their compounds. And so they feel um, uh, confident, or at least they're encouraged that they'll be able to sort of get around this problem with target engagement. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it, it was it was sad. And so th um, there were people that were quite disappointed about these and, and uh, you know, it had been described as a game changer and it's always very easy to get um, excited by the hype. But, you know, the reality is it was only one um, approach. And um, if there's anything we've learned in, you know, neurological diseases, um, it's, it's never that simple. So, um, Okay, but there have been alternatives to antisense that um, people have been working on. And so here, so this is the antisense um, that we've been talking about. Then there is the RNA inhibitor um, uh, silencing. And so that is introducing a small hairpin RNA or a, 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 a micro RNA into a viral vector, which can then be introduced and then expressed in the cell um, to, again, um, uh, Target the gene for for silencing, and so um, the you know so the tricky thing about this is that it has to be introduced in a construct in a virus, um, and it has to be uh, directly injected uh, into the CNS, and so that is what the Unicure study um, is doing, which is directly injecting um, AAV virus with the shRNA directly into the striatum. There was another company recently, Voyager, who was just about to get started on their own similar approach, but then they recently stopped theirs. Um, but because it's because they feel that they have a much better um, AAV approach um, with, with better uh, uh, efficacy for delivery. So um, they, and they're, they're doing a number of other diseases too that, that they use this AAV capsid to deliver drug. Um, so they have this uh, proprietary screening technology. It uses monkeys. 
um, to try and uh, get a more specific or at least a more, um, like I said, uh, effective um, entry into the brain tissue. And so here's an example of um, some of the um, different capsids they use that they've trialed in order to get drug into brain because this is one of the you know, big problems. And so these are some of the different capsids that they've made, some of the different AABs that they've made. And then when they use their special technology, they're able to really um, very nicely get into different areas of the brain um, with a lot higher penetration. So that's pretty exciting. And so they hope to roll that out um, sometime in the next year or two, I think. Um, this is just a picture to um, visually show you where, um, how um, uh, effective this is. So this is the control vector that doesn't have anything. Um, these uh, mice, or these monkeys have had um, the vector that has the, that that has um, some, actually, I'm not honestly sure if it's specifically the HDT gene here or not, but this is, it's, it's getting into neurons here, um, but getting into neurons throughout the tissue. But it is interesting that they kind of focus on that there's a neuronal tropism because I think, um, you know, we, we have evidence that there are different cell types that are involved, but nevertheless, these are some of the improvements that are being made in, in the gene delivery um, arena. Um, there are, uh, approaches that include zinc finger transcriptional um, repressors. And so that's kind of a, um, that's an interesting approach. And so that's being done by a company called Sangamo. Um, and uh, what they have is a, um, a, a mimic of a molecule that has zinc finger domains that um, binds directly to the DNA. And this is again, another uh, sort of naturally occurring <clears throat> relationship. Uh, proteins that have zinc finger uh, domains, they bind the DNA. And so what this company then does is then attach to this zinc finger, um, either uh, transcriptional enhancers or repressors. And so in this case with HD, they've created a compound that has a, the zinc finger attached to a repressor gene to um, decrease protein. Uh, in their studies, they've uh, been able to show that they can decrease the amount of Huntington's uh, protein using this approach. And so here's a zinc finger just um, uh, against, against the gene. And then here's a control zinc finger. And so you can see that you get decreased mutant Huntington protein and in, interestingly, um, no change in the, in the wild type. Um, again, like the other antisense, they were able to show that using this approach, they were, um, they rescued to some small degree, some of the behavioral changes. And so these are um, behavioral measures. In the blue is the control mouse. Um, in the gray is the Huntington's disease mouse. And so for some of these uh, approaches, or so some of these um, measures, there is a statistically significant change in, in, some, in some of the behaviors. You can see a little bit of rescue for these. So there, there's, um, there may be some improvement using, um, using zinc finger biology, and uh, we'll see what happens with humans. Um, so, so it's great news that there are different ways you can knock down gene, um, but what's the, the remaining questions are um, compound Huntington gene, Huntington gene variants that are naturally occurring is associated with a developmental disorder. So, and we know that Huntington knockout in the mouse <clears throat> is lethal. So it has an important role um, during development, uh, so when we think about knocking down the protein, uh, how careful do we have to be about that wild type version, um, and and when um, when do you knock it down? Um, so, uh, you know, if you don't have specific knockdown, when can you afford to lose wild type Huntington? But also uh, on the flip side, how late is too late? So we know that. Um, some of these methods are that, you know, the animal studies are when you, you, you have an animal model that's overexpressing some crazy amount and then you give them drug and sometimes you're not essentially giving them drug when they're symptomatic. Sometimes it's, it's early on. Um, when a person is symptomatic, is that too late? Um, when do you need to give it in terms of the clinical onset? Because we know that there's aggregate protein, but if the aggregate protein is there and then you get rid of it later, uh, you may have missed the boat. That aggregate protein may be inducing non-cell autonomous changes that may have its own feed-forward loop, 
And so um, you need to get it before that nidus, before that little irritating piece of sand starts uh, causing a, you know, a pearl in the brain. So anyway, so um, those are some of the issues that, that need to be considered um, and are being considered. But for now, um, none of these approaches are really knocking it down completely all the way anyway. But uh, and so th this is, um, you know, in Portlandia, they had that skit about you can pickle that. So you can CRISPR that. The, um, there have been, there's a lot of interest out there for whether or not you can CRISPR edit the um, Huntington um, gene. And so this is just a proof of concept that um, in a mouse model, they, uh, so with the, the CRISPR, remember they, they need to have two guides that recognize where you want to do the editing. And so, so they have these guides that recognize the area um, in exon one. And then when they um, use the enzyme to, to um, edit out that region, they can get rid of the CAG. And so this is just, I just threw this on here, just it's a, it's a measure of the protein. You can see that um, if you use the guide RNA that recognizes Huntington's disease, so if you use that CRISPR element um, aimed at the Huntington protein, you get decreased amount of Huntington protein, and that's compared to <clears throat> if you just use a control guide sequence. So it works in the mouse. Um, and uh, I think yeah, and so they also showed that there was some benefit um, to behavior, and um, and so this is the the red is the uh, correct knockdown, black is wild type, and so again, similarly, black. You want to get closer to black um, with the CRISPR editing, you can actually get some improvement. Obviously, there's a lot of issues with CRISPR and um, you know specificity and timing and all that, but. Um, it's being looked at. So, um, but we've had successes with other diseases like HIV, where we said we're just going to make a cocktail of, of um, drugs. So what, um, what are the possibilities here? So, um, okay, let me do this because underneath here is something, let me okay, get rid of that. Okay. So, we think about the repeat as being unstable, and you know we're thinking about it in terms of generation to generation. So here's just a you know typical example. So there's a mom who's 48, uh, onset was 48, she had 47 repeats. She has a daughter that has actually one less. She has a son that has maybe one more, and that son can then have uh, an individual that has a much bigger uh, repeat. So the repeat is unstable, and that's the case for other repeat diseases. Um, and, uh, but what's interesting or, or another important piece of this is that repeat is unstable, not just between generations, but it's unstable in the individual himself. So there is somatic instability. So not the germline, but the somatic tissue itself, um, shows CAG repeat instability. And the big take home is that the idea is that that instability is contributing to, um, disease progression, and disease onset. So that um, the instability that has been measured um, occurs throughout the body, but it seems to be much higher in the CNS. So here is an individual, these are two individuals. One person has 43 repeats, another person has 44 repeats, and then they go, and then in this study, they looked at the CAG repeat number or the CAG distribution in different tissues of either the brain or the periphery and they find that in general, there is a much higher proclivity for expansion in brain tissue compared to periphery, except for the liver, which seems to um, occasionally have some um, evidence of increased expansion. Um, so does that matter, that repeat number that is increasing in the brain? And it looks like it probably does. And so the instability is a disease modifier. So here again, you've taken um, two individuals, with, with 47 repeats, <clears throat> and, but one person has an age of onset of 25, and the other person has an age of onset of 41. Now, uh, this was the taken from blood when they were diagnosed, that repeat number. At death, they then um, have that you then measure their repeat size in their frontal cortex and find there is quite a bit of variability in that repeat number within the frontal cortex. So in this person who has a younger age of onset, so these bars indicate um, the frequency of the repeat size. So here is when um, the repeat size is really 
just um, around one or so, um, or, or larger. And um, so in the, in the person who has a very early age of onset, you can see there are more alleles are, are more uh, measures that are expanded to 15 CAG, 20 CAG repeats uh, above what was measured in blood. In contrast, in the person with the um, older age of onset, there's very few um, repeats that are actually more than 10 and above. And so that becomes, so that has been suggested as being uh, suggestive of there being sort of a, a threshold really of, of there's, a, there's a measure we get in blood, but in brain, depending on a number of factors, including the repeat size, that repeat number can get larger and larger. And, in, and somewhere in that increasing expansion is when you can get, um, is when the trigger to um, clinically evident disease is. So what contributes to that instability? And you know, this idea of the instability of repeat is, is, has been studied for a long time in the, at, at the bench. You know, what are the molecular mechanisms that lead to, to repeat instability? But <clears throat> just from a human perspective, from a human epi perspective, what can we find out? Because um, there's gotta be clues there. So um, one uh, interesting observation that has um, gotten a lot of discussion over the last uh, few years is uh, what is the CAG and glutamine relationship? So these are, HD is one of these diseases that we call polyglutamine disease, um, like some of the other CAG repeats. But what, we've, what has been found is that the disease is actually associated not necessarily with the number of glutamines, um, Q, in this case, Q44, but actually the age of onset is related to the number of CAG, specifically CAG repeats, because in the normal allele, you have this some number of CAG repeats. Um, <clears throat> and then after that CAG track, there is a CAA, which also encodes for a glutamine, and then another CAG. So here in this example, um, there is 44 glutamines, yet only 44. 42 CAG repeats um, uninterrupted. Turns out there are uh, individuals that have a loss of this CAA. And so they're called, this is called a loss of interruption allele. And so they only have those 42 CAG repeats and 42 polyglutamines. And on the, on the flip side, there are individuals that have this 42 CAG repeats, the CAA interruption, and then the CAG, and then another CAA and CAG interruption. So again, what you have here are what would be coded as 42 glutamines plus another um, one, two, three, another four glutamines. So you get a total of 46 glutamines. People can interrupt me if that's um, getting unnecessarily confusing. Um, so what's amazingly interesting is that the proclivity for expansion changes again um, with regard to the type of allele you have. And so here, this is um, the expansion ratio. Um, and, and so this is, this is just some value this on the y, alley, y, y axis is more expansion. Um, so here is a um, box plot of a number of individuals that have the canonical repeat number. So this, where they have CAG and then one CA, one CAG. And then individuals that have lost that interruption have a higher rate of expansion. And also a lower age of onset. So uh, in individuals that have lost this, they have um, a statistically significant um, uh, lower, lower age of onset, more severe disease. So that's interesting. So um, that is just proof of concept that the stability that occurs or the instability that occurs can influence age of onset. Um, and, but the, but what's important to know is that there's, this is actually a small number of people. So um, what about, what can we learn from a larger group of people? And that's where our favorite GWAS studies come in. So, you know, you can't do hundreds of thousands of people with HD, but um, there has been uh, increasingly larger studies. And so um, in one of the GWAS that was done a number of years ago, or not number, but recently, um, in 9,000 people with HD, they tried to make an association between age of onset and, and uh, genomic variants. 
And so um, in doing so, they found a number of genes within loci that were associated with young or late onset. And many of these genes turn out to be DNA repair genes. Um, so that was really exciting. It gives us, and because there's more than one, it really suggests that there is something going on biologically that um, is influencing the stability and age of onset of the, of the gene. And so beyond the genes that I just showed you that um, looking at a number of other um, variants and then the, the biological pathways associated with it, um, specifically mismatch repair, um, and um, complex binding of these proteins that manage mismatch repair are all associated with the age of onset. So that has led to um, newer approaches that are being considered uh, to approach the disease progression from a different angle. And so, um, so one company called Triplet is already um, in phase one or so, phase two trials, uh, trying to interfere with this process. So here is a graphic of this is a normal allele. And then um, this normal allele just makes a normally folded protein and that's it. You can also have a disease allele here and that disease allele can lead to incorrectly folded protein which can then also initiate DNA damage sign signatures. I mean, this is, this is proposed. But the thing is once you have a disease allele you can then, as we've already seen, have a proclivity for increasing mutational burden throughout the brain, which can then have, um, uh, which can then recruit DNA repair uh, genes. And so how would that happen? Let me go down to here. So ignore this for a sec. Um, these repeat expansions um, can sometimes form loops and that is what uh, recruits some of these uh, repair proteins over to the region. And once those repair proteins do their magic, they cut and they allow um, the DNA sequence to fill in, that resolution of the loop structure that was trying to be fixed can then eventually lead to expansion of that gene. So that's, that's one of the ways in which the DNA repair is being um, uh, attributed to, to uh, expansion. So what that means phenotyp phenotypically is this. So going back to this um, image up here, so you have a normal allele. And uh, so these are all little neurons and they all have a uh, repeat number of 22, stable, nothing else to do. You have a disease allele um, that now is unstable. And so now you can have, maybe start with 46, but maybe sometimes you get up to 49 or 48. Uh, and then each time that gets bigger, there is an increased chance of that getting expanded even larger to the point where at some point you reach the threshold uh, where you now have neurons um, and other cells that have a um, disease associated repeat number in the brain tissue. Again, that idea of a threshold. So um, this is now pulling back the idea of, or, or pulling together this idea of somatic mutation and, and, um, and association with the disease onset. Um, and I would be remiss to not include neuroinflammation since that is um, what I think about a lot. And, uh, you know, this is a generic image that just shows that neurons are not living <clears throat> in a silo. There are astrocytes and microglia and oligodendrocytes, all these cells that contribute either to neuronal health or neuronal injury, um, some of which is re reversible. So it's important to um, address. And also, I think important because even as you're trying to figure out how to get rid of the HTT gene, like I said, if that, if those aggregates are forming and they happen way in the beginning and there's nothing you can do about it, um, can you at least just sort of take away some of the fuel that's causing disease progression? So can you at least tamper down whatever inflammatory um, reaction or, or mechanism is, is um, causing further neurodegeneration? And so there have been some um, uh, trials that have been, that had started and actually stopped um, trying to target neuroinflammation. So let me take you down here. Um, Laquinamod, and, um, which was a, a drug that's been trialed for MS or, or is being trialed, um, and minocycline. These drugs were specifically trying to um, reduce the inflammatory phenotype of microglia. Um, the problem being that we don't really have a good sense of the mechanisms for a lot of these drugs. Like minocycline can do 50 uh, different things. And so 
they did not show benefit and maybe it's not that surprising. And this is also why a lot of people in the neuroinflammation field are trying to get a better handle on what is neuroinflammation. There, you, know, you, you, can't, you don't wanna just turn them all off because there are important um, immune um, behaviors that you need. Uh, and then, so, and then there's some other, um, other drugs that are in trial now, again, trying to curb the inflammatory response. So in summary, right now, I think what's in play are some, our ongoing antisense oligonucleotide um, trials from WAVE and some other um, companies, RNA interference being delivered by viral capsid and improved methods of introducing with, uh, via virus. Um, oh, I didn't talk about this, but there are um, uh, there are approaches to try and use that those splicing molecules or splicing compounds uh, to degrade um, the protein, and so those are actually also in, in phase one two trials. This was actually a drug that was originally designed for SMA, um, but now they're going to try and repurpose it for Huntington's disease and see if you can uh, decrease protein. And then, like I said, so these. Um, these DNA repair proteins that th that thread was born out of, of human um, clinical features. So that's kind of exciting. And uh, there are different ways that people are targeting it. Triplet Therapeutics is actually using an antisense against one of these um, DNA damage repair genes and then neuroinflammation. So, you know, um, as is the case with many diseases, the question is when do you treat and how? And so hopefully, we're going to continue to make progress on all of that. I mean, every every um, advance we make in this disease helps other diseases and vice versa. So I think we're all we're all learning more, um, and then so eventually we'll get to the um, bright horizon that we hope to get for these diseases. So I'll um, stop there. And um, if anyone has any questions, should I? Maybe I'll stop my screen. Thank you, Dr. Jayadeh, for that excellent and deep dive into um, HD genetics and treatment um, uh, um, audience. Uh, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or type it in the chat box or unmute yourself. Um, and I'll keep an eye out on hands or the chat box. Um, so um, uh, while we are waiting, um, I wanted to ask Dr. J. Dave a question. Um, you um, illustrated so well that it's not just the size of the repeats uh, that we determine during our neurogenetics analysis that determines the course of Huntington disease. And knowing what we know then, if knocking out the, the protein itself did not benefit the, the Roche trial, then why would downstream therapy uh, like modifying RNA, et cetera, work. Um, I was just under, trying to understand the rationale for that. That's a great, that's a great question. I think, um, it, unfortunately, the, the question sort of lends itself to a lot of hand-waving. But um, I would say that um, in the Roche trial and some of these approaches, you're dealing with the horse is already out of the barn. And so in people that are symptomatic or even near symptomatic, if you try and now get rid of the HTT protein, it doesn't help. You're only getting rid of the production of new protein. Um, that whatever is there has already been deposited. Whatever effect of that abnormal protein has already happened to every cell type in the brain. So I say that's probably one of the big um, one of the big reasons. Um, and uh, so, no, whether or not uh, using different methods to knock down gene will. Um, you know, have the same caveats, I would, I would think. So whether or not that's going to be effective, I don't know. We, know, we don't know. Um, you know, one of the benefits of some of these other approaches like the AAB is that you don't, is that it's ongoing. It's, it's, it's um, constantly being expressed, that shRNA. And so you may have better long-term production of knockdown compared to an antisense that you have to keep um, injecting. So that's, that I mean, that's one technical difference, I'd say. But um, yeah. I think that we, I think it didn't really get a good shot, the knockdown. Got it. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, um, uh, I'm monitoring the chat box here. Uh, don't see any hands. Um, 
I've got a ton of questions, but I'm not going to bore the audience uh, with it. Um, maybe I'll just ask one more, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Uh, so there is um, there are many variables, and the reason I, why we are all interested in the treatment of HD, as you said, is it potentially forms a template for treatment of other autosomal dominant triplet repeat disorders that we see, such as spinocerebellar ataxias. So we are all waiting with bated breath for the HD trials to succeed so we can recapitulate those successes in yeah. other diseases. And that's why I really think that, uh, that the work you're doing is absolutely stupendous. It's great, it has a lot of meaning. And if you, knowing what you know currently, if you were to design a, a perfect trial, would you use multiple mechanisms uh, to, to target HD? I would, I absolutely would. And I think, um, so I think that it's a, a good biological guess that that um, abnormal protein is harmful. So I think ongoing trying, you know, getting rid of the, the abnormal protein in gene is a, is a reasonable approach. But I, I do think that um, trying to get a handle on, so that, that co combining that um, knockdown along with trying to protect from increased expansion is an excellent approach, given that we think that all this is happening in the brain tissue. And so it needs to be curbed. So even if you, um, you know, somehow get, somehow you can reduce the protein at age 50, if by now in the brain, it's up to 200 because you haven't delivered the drug, that would be um, unfortunate. So if you can sort of stop that early, in fact, um, maybe you can even treat earlier than you can with knockdown. Um, you know, I have a bias towards thinking that um, these other glial responses to Huntington's and to other proteopathies um, is significant. And, um, you know, if you, if you take uh, in, in HD patient serum, there is evidence of increased inflammatory markers. And maybe that's not surprising. I mean, there, there, there's, there's something abnormal in the brain. So there's going to be a, a response that can then also um, be seen in the periphery. But, um, you know, if you could get a handle on what is the problem um, that's causing the inflammatory response, I think you, you, you could leverage that. So for instance, you know, I think that there has been an obsession about, oh, we have to help glial cells clear all this protein because that's the problem. And I don't, and that's not necessarily the case, I think, because, uh, you know, clearing all that protein is not straightforward and it induces uh, um, uh, an inflammatory response that you uh, need to somehow manage. And, and, and that is likely contributing to some of the problems that you're getting downstream. So yes, so I think that multiple approaches targeting multiple cell types would eventually be quite useful. You know, we're never gonna be able to get rid of it, um, but can you keep age of onset at bay? You know, make people get symptoms when they're 80 instead of 50. That might be a more reasonable approach. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Doctors Elliot, Dr. Doty, Linda, and any other um, last comments um, before we wind down? Oh, I suppose this is very important <laughs> to, to claim CME credit. Uh, please follow uh, these steps. Um,